Hello everyone, in today's video lecture, we are going to learn and discuss about carbon and its compounds. Previously, we learnt about metals and non-metals and looked in detail about their physical and chemical properties and also discussed about the exceptions in both the categories. We learnt in brief about how metal reacts with water, acids and metal salts. During our discussion of the chemical properties of metals, we observed that some metals are more reactive than other metals and thus reached at the reactivity series of metals. The reactivity series showed that while metals such as potassium and sodium are very reactive, while metals such as gold and platinum are almost inert in nature. Further, we also looked into the reaction of metals and non-metals with each other to form ionic compounds and also looked into the properties of ionic compounds. At the end of the discussion, we looked into how metals are extracted from their ores depending on the reactivity series. Today, we are going to discuss about one of the most widely used non-metal present around us which is none other than carbon. Majority of the things around us is made up of carbon or some of its compound. Our body as we know is made up of cells in which carbon is one of the most abundant component. Majority of the foods whether it be carbohydrates, proteins, fats or any other items that we consume has carbon component in it. Even the primary source of food that is plants requires carbon dioxide, a carbon component to produce food and oxygen by the process of photosynthesis. So if we look closely, we are surrounded by carbon and carbon compounds. Therefore in today's discussion, we are going to look at some interesting things related to one of the most versatile element carbon and its compounds and also try to understand the properties of the individual element as well as the compound in details. With the vast array of things in which carbon is present, many of us might be thinking that it is due to the abundance of carbon on earth. But surprisingly, carbon constitutes only about 0.02% of earth's crust in the form of minerals and around 0.03% of the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. So what makes carbon so special that it is able to form so many compounds? One of the most important thing about formation of any compound is bonding that is how the constituent elements interact with each other so that they satisfy the valence shell configuration and attain stability. And in our previous videos, we have already learnt about ionic compounds which are formed when an electron rich element donates the excess electron to an element which is lacking in electron in such a way that both of them can attain a stable electronic configuration. For instance, we looked into the bonding in NaCl, MgCl2, CaCl2, etc., which are formed by ionic bonding. During our discussion on ionic compounds, we noted that they exhibit high melting and boiling points alongside electrical conductivity in molten state. So it is safe to say that the properties of any compound speak a lot about the properties. Now if we look at the properties of carbon compounds, say ethanol or chloroform, they have very low melting and boiling points compared to that of ionic compounds and often evaporate when kept in open. Also, they are found to be non-conductors of electricity. Therefore, we can infer that the compounds are the forces that holds these compounds together are not very strong and do not produce any ions as well. Now the question is what kind of bond does carbon makes? In order to answer this question, let us have a look at the electronic configuration of carbon. Carbon's atomic number is 6, 
so its electronic configuration is 2 4 that means it has 4 electrons in the outermost shell and in order to attain noble gas configuration it needs to either gain 4 electrons or lose 4 electrons. So we have two scenarios. Scenario 1 Carbon gains 4 electrons. Under this condition carbon will have 10 electrons and only 6 protons resulting in C4- anion. But it will be difficult for the nucleus with only 6 protons to hold on to 10 electrons and thus an unstable configuration. Scenario 2 Carbon loses 4 electrons. Under this condition, carbon will have 6 protons and only 2 electrons resulting in C4 plus cation. But in order to remove 4 electrons, a large amount of energy will be required. And in addition to that, the two remaining electron will experience greater force from the nucleus, thus destabilizing the atom. Then how does carbon form any compound? So rather than gaining or losing electrons, carbon share its valence electrons with other atom of carbon or any atoms of other elements in order to attain stable noble gas configuration. This type of bonding in which the outermost shell electrons are shared among the constituent atoms to attain stable electronic configuration is called covalent bonding and the compounds so formed are called as covalent compounds. In these compounds, the shared electrons belong to outermost shell of both the atoms. The covalent bonding is not limited to just carbon Rather, a large number of elements form their respective compounds by covalent bonding. Let us look at some examples to have a better understanding of the bonding process. We start by looking into the formation of fluorine molecule F2. Fluorine, as we have already seen, belongs to group 17, the halogens, and has an electronic configuration of 2,7. So, it needs one more electron to complete the octet and attain stability. Therefore, in an attempt to complete the outer shell, two fluorine atoms share one of their L-shell electron to form a molecule of F2. As they share one electron among each other, the shared pair of electrons is said to constitute a single covalent bond between the two fluorine atoms and can be depicted using electron dot structure as follows. Now it is important to note that while representing the formation of covalent bond formation, only the valence shell has to be shown and not the entire electron distribution. Let us look at one of the most important molecule required for the survival of living organism formed by covalent bonding and that is none other than water. In water, one oxygen atom combines with two hydrogen atoms to form H2O. So, if we look at hydrogen atom, it has only one electron in the outermost shell and needs one more electron to attain nearest noble gas configuration, that is helium. On the other hand, oxygen has an electronic configuration of 2,6, which means the outermost shell has 6 electrons and need 2 more electrons to complete the octet and reach nearest noble gas configuration of neon. So, one oxygen atom shares 2 of its L-shell electrons with 2 hydrogen atoms in order to complete the valence shell configuration of both oxygen and hydrogen as shown by electron dot structure. In this case, we see oxygen atom form two covalent bonds, one with each hydrogen atom. Now, let us see how ammonia is formed. Ammonia is made up of nitrogen and hydrogen. The electronic configuration of nitrogen reveals it has five electrons in the valence shell, while hydrogen, as already seen, has one electron in the outermost shell. So, 
in order to satisfy the complete valence shell configuration, three hydrogen atoms share their electron with three valence shell electrons of a single nitrogen atom. In doing so, each hydrogen atom attains electronic configuration of helium while the nitrogen atom attains the neon electronic configuration. Here we can see the formation of three single covalent bonds. Co this video is concluded here and you surely find something new in the next video for test series paper, tutorials and other study materials. Please visit our website www.livitaacademy.com.